All right, let's go to Luke chapter 15 again this morning, shall we? Luke chapter 15, going to spend the next couple weeks finishing up this chapter uh, as we consider the story of the uh, prodigal son. I think as you read this, and uh, I hope during the next couple of weeks you'll take some time and just become extremely familiar with the story of the prodigal son. I, it, honestly, I think it is the best, deepest story that Jesus ever told. It contains information that, uh, we, honestly, we could, uh, we could spend weeks here uh, just probing the different things that are in this story. It's, it's just a phenomenal story as Christ stood in front of a crowd and shared this information with them, just gave this story. He was teaching his disciples. He was reaching out to people that weren't believers, and he was condemning the Pharisees for the way they lived their life and went about the things that they did. It's just phenomenal all that's here. So I, I, I trust that as we take a couple of weeks to look at this particular story, that we can do it justice and that you can see just exactly what's here as you just consider how incredible Christ was. I, I don't, obviously, it will be glorious someday when all of us have the opportunity to sit at the feet of Christ and listen from him directly. I, I can't imagine hearing him teach. But I, if I could go back in a time machine to any time that my, my uh, choice would be take me back to the three years that Christ ministered on earth and just let me be a mouse that travels around and, and observes and just listens to Christ teach. He was obviously the master teacher, and obviously he could tell a story in a way that would wind its way into the heart of the individual. It would comfort the believer. It would convict the unsaved, and it would make mad, if it can say it that way, it would irritate to no end the, the Pharisees who thought they were some group of people. Let's take time just to read this story, if you would, beginning in verse 11. Notice what it says. And he said, that's Jesus, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son." Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing and he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. 
Yet you, uh, you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when, his son, but when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for your brother who was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. The story of two sons that Jesus tells is a phenomenal story. We know it today as the story of the prodigal son. But in this particular event, it's really the story of a radical God who is incredible. Tim Keller would say it this way. In his book, The Prodigal God, he gives this quote. He said, Jesus Christ, who had all the power in the world, saw us enslaved by the very things we thought would free us. So he emptied himself of his glory and became a servant. He laid aside the infinities and immensities of his being and at the cost of his own life, paid the debt of our sin, purchasing us the only place our hearts can rest, in his father's house. That's pretty radical on God's part. To do what has been done for us, to be able to spend eternity in our father's house, is incredible when you stop and think about all that took place. And I trust that as we go through this particular story that Jesus tells, which is a fairly short story, he probably would have told this story in about five to seven minutes. But what it communicated is just incredible. The themes that are here we could speak on probably for the next 10 weeks if we just wanted to take different themes and tackle stuff that is in this. What God has done on our behalf is is just staggers the mind when you think of all that he has done. I hope as we come into this passage, there's a couple things that, I guess, goals that I have that want to communicate, and that is, first of all, that you might grasp the various concepts that are presented in this story told by Christ. I hope you will. I hope you can see them. I hope the, your, your mind just will, will dig deeper into this passage. I, I trust, I find this, that... Whenever preaching goes on, it is extremely stimulating to the mind. And your mind begins to work when, whenever preaching takes place. It's one of those things over the years that you just begin to see. It doesn't mean you're following me all the time, but your mind's working. It may race down different trails and think about different things, but it's kind of amazing. So I, I hope that over the course of the next couple of weeks as we just probe this story, that your mind will be in gear and it will stimulate thoughts that you can just track down. I hope as we go through this that you'll see it as a radical God who would do what he did to seek sinners. It's amazing. What God did to bring you salvation should cause us to realize that we are forever indebted to him for his work. I trust that as we go through this that you'll gain a love for God because of what he's done for you. I hope that love that you have for Christ will deepen as you see in the true sense that he was the elder brother that not condemned the younger brother who became a prodigal, squandered it all, then came and asked for repentance. But I hope you'll see that Christ was the true elder brother who did all he could to seek the prodigal to bring him back and to help him on his journey. And I pray that each of us will commit ourselves to living out the concepts that Christ teaches, that we'll just capture who Christ is, the essence of his person, the primary emphasis of his work, and that we will yield ourselves and commit ourselves to being what Christ was, to people that we will have the opportunity to reach that maybe others won't. And I'll tell you, you will reach people if you live out these truths, your life, you're, you're, you, no one lives to themselves. No one dies to themselves. Your life will have impact. You will touch others. There will be people in heaven because of the impact that you had in their life as you live out these truths and as you grasp them. And so as we come to Luke chapter 15, the 
textual idea is simply this, to give you my things I put together. In this chapter, Christ teaches three parables that carefully identify the work that his disciples are to do. I think he's primarily teaching us. I don't think he's primarily condemning the Pharisees, although that happens. And I don't think here he's primarily trying to draw uh, sinners. I think he's teaching disciples how he wants them to live. And the mentality that they are to possess, and then the spirit with which they are to minister. Now, as we come to this chapter, I think you can learn the acti- that the activity or the work that disciples do really identifies them as belonging to Christ. How do you know if a person truly is a believer? The scriptures would make us say it this way, by their works, you will know them. So how do you know if I'm a believer? Well, the truth is this, God looketh on the heart. So from God's perspective, does he know if I'm a believer? Absolutely. He can look down and look right into the heart and know the condition of my heart. But how do you know if I'm a believer? And how does anybody else know if we're believers? And the answer is God looketh on the heart, but man looketh on the outward appearance. And that's not saying, by the way, I may be dressed, because most of us dress, and our dress is fitting into our culture. The idea of that is by the way we live. The way you live identifies you as a believer before the world. And then what happens is they just begin to watch, and the Spirit of God uses that to bring conviction and ultimately to bring some to salvation. And you may never even know it. And so as we come to this passage, we simply understand that the work that those that Christ came to do is identical for those of us that are saved. We do what Christ did. We do the very same thing. Now, what can we learn from what Christ teaches in this parable? I want to deal with this parable, and I'm going to deal with three specific things. As you look at it, I want to, and and I hope in doing this, we can open it up and so that you can see all the details. And I'm just going to take a week for each of them. So the first thing I want to look at, let me give you the outline. This is what it'll be. First of all, I want you to see the mentality of the prodigal. Just want you to capture the mentality of a prodigal. Simply realizing this, that only prodigals can get salvation. Nobody else. You got to be a prodigal to get salvation. Nobody else gets it. So you have to understand the mentality of a prodigal. Because the truth is, if we're here today and we're Christians, we're believers in Christ, we're still prodigals. And we always maintain a prodigal's mentality. Now, I want to develop that idea. The second thing I want you to see from this passage, which we'll look at next week, is this. The responsibility of the elder brother. And and, and just deal with with that subject next week. What is the responsibility of of an elder brother? What is the responsibility then of brothers and sisters in Christ? Or what is the responsibility of believers? And Jesus paints the picture by going to the exact opposite extreme, shows the opposite extreme of what it should not be, and in doing so shows exactly what it should be. And Jesus Christ is the elder brother. And I hope in this passage you can see that he is the one who is exalted. So we want to look at the mentality of a prodigal. We want to look at the responsibility of the elder brother. And then the final thing I want you to see in this particular passage of Scripture is the hospitality of the father. Or we could say it, the graciousness of the father. Because the father opens his house and bestows upon the prodigal that comes home everything Get this guy a new robe. Get this guy new shoes. Put a ring on his finger and kill the calf that is at, at the best calf out there that we have, the fatted calf. Kill it. Let's throw a feast and let's celebrate. The hospitality of the Father in this passage is incredible. And I think what you'll see is it's a picture of what God has done for us, what Christ has done for us. And you see in this passage really the Trinity at work And you see here an incredible story that really lays out the entire work of God and then the entire plan of salvation from our perspective. So let's look today at the mentality of the prodigal. I want you to see the story basically involves three main characters, the father and the two sons. It's really a tale of two sons is what MacArthur calls his book, A Tale of Two Sons, Story of the Prodigal Son. 
neither of the sons are more important than the other. They just represent different things. And the father here is a picture of God himself. It involves several key concepts. There's a lot in here. But trust me. There's a ton of material in here, and I, I don't, I'm not sure how, if we'll be able to exhaust it, but we'll look at it if we can. It teaches those of us that are disciples, and it exposes those that are not. That's what this, th th this, this whole thing is going to teach those who are disciples, but this concept is going to expose those that are not. The story is built around a journey. It's a journey, if you would, as we, we read that journey, it's a journey of the younger son. And the story is built around a journey from wealth to poverty. Because the son asks for his portion of his inheritance, and in that culture and in that day, the father gave it to him. And it's obvious from this particular story that this father is an extremely wealthy man. Very wealthy so what this son received was a fairly substantial sum of money. But then it's a journey from wealth to poverty. You ever watch on TV sometimes? You ever see the shows of those who win the lottery and then lose it? You ever watch those? Guys win these uh, lotteries. They win uh, $100 million. They win $50 million. And... And, uh, and, and then within a short period of time, they're stone broke. You ever watch them? It's kind of fun to watch. Never felt sorry for them, but uh, it's kind of interesting how they all of a sudden have a lot of friends. All of a sudden just buy a lot of stuff. And within a short period of time, they think that what they had as wealth is gone. That's this prodigal son, a lot of wealth. And from the story you read, squandered primarily with prostitutes. Imagine that. So it's a journey from wealth to poverty. It's a journey, if you would, from fun to desperation. This guy's going out. He's got all the money he needs. He's got all the wealth he needs right now. He's got everything. He's going into a far country. He needs to get away. Because of the way he's going to live, he needs to get away from the father. <laughs> It's always interesting how that works, too. Whenever the heart is turned in a wrong direction, you ever notice people want to get away from other believers? It's kind of interesting how it plays out. They've got to get away because they're going to do stuff that they, uh, they really don't want you to know about. So this guy's journey takes him to a far country, and there, lots of money, young and single, and we're going to have a party life, and we're going to have fun. And it ends up in desperation. And that's normally where the path of fun takes a person. You know that in our culture today? Now you got to watch out when you spin your life and you make fun the primary object of life. Look out. Because that's what uh, Tim Keller means when he, thinks, when he says this. He says, Christ saw us enslaved by the very thing we thought would free us. And the thing I thought I could go out there and have fun with is the thing that begins to enslave an individual. And then only Christ can rescue him. Watch out for the path that you think is fun because fun, apart from Christ, leads to desperation. I've always thought it interesting in the Scriptures that God is concerned about us having a good time. It's one of the reasons, I think, in our papers, the Bill of Rights, I think it was, or the, Dec the Constitution, that when they wrote into our country that it was concerned about our happiness as well. But as you study happiness and you study fun in Scripture, you find something that's very interesting, and that's this. God always wraps it in responsibility. Can you have fun in life? The answer is yes. But you can only have fun in life if you understand that God wraps all his pleasure in responsibility. And if you try to seek the fun without understanding the responsibility, you will destroy your life. And you see people in our culture today. I was watching the other day a program on TV that said this. It was kind of fascinating to see that 70% of people in jail in America, it is alcohol-related. And I thought, it's really funny that in our country, we want to get rid of guns. 
We want to get rid of this or we want to get rid of that. You want to get rid of something that would save our country billions of dollars? Get rid of alcohol. Go ahead on the street corner and preach that message. You might get shot. No pun intended there. You know what I'm saying? But 70% of people in jail in America do stuff under the influence of alcohol and end up in jail. You know, what they, you know what they don't understand? They want the pleasure, but they don't want the responsibility. And God always wraps his pleasures in responsibility. And if you'll use it responsibly, you can enjoy it. This son's journey was a journey in pursuit of fun that ended up in desperation because he wanted the fun without the responsibility, and he paid the price. This journey is a journey of self-sufficiency to needing help. When he leaves and goes to this far country, he has in his pocket a substantial amount of wealth, money. A lot of it. Because his father, who is a picture of God, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's a very wealthy man. And when he gave this son a portion, he was self-sufficient, and he saw himself that way. I have everything I need now to go out and do what I want to do with my life, and I can, there is nothing, as Solomon said, no pleasure that I cannot purchase. And so he purchased it all. But it's a journey of self-sufficiencies to ending up in a field hired by a servant to go out into the field, and in that field his responsibility is take care of the pigs. And he's so desperate that when he feeds the pigs, he's envious of what the pigs are eating. I call that desperation. In that culture, that's really desperation because you know what the Jewish culture thought of a pig. And so the picture here that Christ paints is a picture of desperation at its very deepest level. You see, it's a journey from pride to humility. I have this money. I can do what I want. And self-governance was the thing that got this kid in trouble. And as he went out, he began to govern his life based upon his own principles, based upon his own pleasures, and he just did what he wanted to do. And somehow, for even us today, that looks like a life that's fun. I can do what I want to do, and nobody's going to tell me what to do. Yeah, go ahead on that one. Let me know how it works out for you. Because it's probably going to work out the same way it worked out for the prodigal son. It's going to be a journey from pride ending up with humility, and no one would help him. No one would help him. And what you see in this, it's a journey that left him living in a pathetic condition. And it's a journey that left him longing to go home. If I could just go home is where he ends up. And the whole story is built around this kid's journey. I don't know how old he was, but this son's journey. The concepts that I'd like to show you as we talk about the mentality of the prodigal, there's two concepts that really surface in this young man's life that we need to look at, and the first is the concept of repentance. Because repentance is the mentality of a prodigal. Repentance isn't just saying, oh, I'm sorry for that sin that I committed yesterday. And that's really not what repentance is. Repentance comes from a Greek word, meta. You know the, word, the, the meta, metamorphosis. We use meta in several of our English words. Meta neo, the word neo in the Greek language simply means mind. The, the, the mind, of your neo was your mind. Meta, change of mind. Simply what that word means. It's that it is, if you would, if you, if you understand repentance today, and if I can get you to understand a concept today, it's a concept that I want you to see is the, rep the concept that repentance is a mentality with which people who have journeyed in life to the point of going from fun to desperation, going from pride to humility, going from this to the realization that I need help. 
that I am a sinner and I need a Savior. It is repentance that takes you there. It is a mentality. It is a way of thinking, if you would. It is a mindset that you have that when you become a prodigal and recognize your need and then come to Christ for salvation, you come with a mindset. And that mindset is basically this. I can't get to heaven on my own. I cannot earn salvation. I cannot work for salvation. I cannot attain salvation because of anything that I am or anything that I have or anything that I do. Repentance is coming saying I, there, nothing. I am in desperate straits. I have come to the end of my rope. I have no rope. I need someone to throw me a rope. And if someone doesn't throw me the rope, I'm done. And repentance is just realizing, I'm done. It's a mentality. It's a way of thinking. And it is prevalent in the story. And it is a mentality that really needs to be understood. You see, repentance recognizes a couple of things. Repentance recognizes my unworthiness to be called a son. Look at verse 19, or 18. Look what, look what happens in verse 18. It says, verse 17, but when he had come to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Watch this. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I have shamed you. I have embarrassed you. I have squandered everything you gave to me. I'm not worthy to bear your name. That's repentance. And that is a mentality that the repentant individual has. Are we worthy to be called children of God? <laughs> the answer is no. But by his grace... We are. You see, repentance simply recognizes this. My unworthiness to be called a child of God. Or in this case, in verse 18, again in verse 21, he repeats the same thing. I am not worthy. And what it says is, I'm unworthy. To be called a child of God, I'm unworthy to be called a son. And repentance is a mentality that just recognizes on a regular, continual, ongoing basis that he's worthy, I'm not. The worthiness is not mine. The worthiness is Christ's. And what we all say is this. He is worthy. He is Christ. He is the Savior. He is the Redeemer. He alone is worthy. Songwriter maybe said it best, the old hymn that says, I am not worthy the least of his favor, but Jesus left heaven for me. See? And repentance is a mentality that doesn't say, I am somebody. No. He is somebody. He is somebody. He is the Savior. Repentance also recognizes this. As you look at this story, it's my own inability. My inability here. This son came to the realization that through all he was given and through all that he possessed and all the resources that he had, he squandered it. And, and you have to recognize, and, and the mentality that exists in a person who is a prodigal, is a, a, a mentality of I'm not worthy, but I also don't have the ability. He did not have the ability to handle the resources that he was given. He squandered them. With prostitutes, with reckless living. See? My inability. Scripture would say it this way. There is none righteous. What? No, not one. Scripture would say it this way, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Scripture would say it this way, without me you can do. And Scripture would say it this way, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth. That's right. 
Why? Why does Christ need to live in me? Why without him can I do nothing? Because of my total inability to do anything that would count for eternity. Nothing. But the amazing thing is Christ is worthy and Christ has the ability. I don't have to worry about having the ability because Christ has the ability and he gives it to me, enabling me to be saved, but also enabling me to do things that would have eternal value. He gives us that. The final thing you see here, and this is my indwelling sin. In verse 18 and verse 21, when this guy comes to his realization, he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and I have sinned before you. And the idea here is simply this, is I am still a sinner in need of a Savior. That is the mentality of a prodigal. So a prodigal always recognizes this, whether you've been whether you're not saved and come to the realization that you need salvation or whether you've been saved recently or you've been saved for 50 years, it never changes. It's, it's what Romans talks about when it says this, that, that we live by faith and it's faith to faith. It's an ongoing lifestyle, so you never lose this. I always live realizing this. I'm always unworthy to be called a son. And I always have indwelling sin that I have to wrestle with. And I am incapable of doing anything that would count for eternity. But Christ is worthy. And Christ is able. And Christ is sinless. And that's our Savior who came to rescue us in our helpless condition. It's an amazing story. My indwelling sin, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth what? No good thing. <laughs> Every time I read that verse, I laugh because when I was a kid, that I think was my dad's favorite verse. He quoted that verse to me more than any other verse that I was quoted in my lifetime growing up. I'd come home and say, Dad, I'd like to go out with the guys on Saturday night. No, you can't go. Why not? Because I don't trust you. Why don't you trust me? Because I know that in your flesh dwelleth no good thing. And he was right. <laughs> he, was, he was so right. Because I know what you're going to do. You see, God sees not my righteousness, but God sees Christ's righteousness. Now, the concept here is simply this. I live dependent on a radical God who gave his son as my savior and his spirit as my enabler. And that's how we live. What's the message that should resonate from this church, from all of us, as we go out in the community and live? The, the message that resonates from all of us is that we're prodigals. We're, we're unworthy to be called sons. We're incapable and unable to produce things that would count for eternity. And we still have indwelling sin that all of us here today still wrestle with. All of us. So then, why does he send us out into the community? Because we have a Savior who has enabled us, who has empowered us, and who has forgiven us our sin. And we go out not to tell others about us, but we go out to tell others about Christ, and the message that resonates from a prodigal is this. We are in desperate need of a Savior, because without him we can do nothing. So I live dependent on a radical God who gave his son to be my savior and his spirit to be my enabler. And I live knowing that I have been forgiven by his radical grace. I'm forgiven. And I know it. So I no longer have to live with the guilt of my sin. Because Jesus paid for my sin. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin left that crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And I live knowing I'm still a sinner. But I know that I'm forgiven. Doesn't mean I go out tomorrow and I'm just going to sin because now I can sin because I've been forgiven. No, I live because he's forgiven me. And I never want to presume upon that grace. I live knowing my capacity and my capability to sin, but I also live knowing my culpability 
for my sin is no longer there. I watched this past week. I suppose you did too. On Monday night when the, the George Zimmerman verdict came down, did you watch on TV? It was rather interesting to watch the various side. I always get a kick out of uh, how different people react in different ways. But uh, when the jury said, as that guy stood there, before six women jurors, now, I wouldn't want to stand before six women jurors that have women's intuition. <laughs> I mean, but you heard the judge when the verdict is read, not guilty. Well, just picture yourself. <sighs> picture yourself standing before the God of the universe. And picture the verdict coming down through the judge who is Jesus Christ, and he looks at us and he says, not guilty. Paid in full the price for your sin. Enter in to the joy of the Lord. Can you imagine that? Can you begin to comprehend that? That, my friend, is a radical God who would allow stinky sinners like us who just are willing to admit that we're stinky sinners in need of a Savior. And the men, that's the prodigal's mentality. And he says, all I have is yours because you're willing to admit who you are. And then we come and as we ask you today, would you consider going down and teaching little kids? You have the opportunity to teach them like somebody down there is teaching one of my grandsons right now, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E Bible. Somebody's teaching that little kid, and divine truth is beginning to work its way into the heart of that little kid. Can you imagine someday when you stand before God and you were his teacher? And you simply realize, God, I didn't have anything in me that was capable of instilling eternal values in the life of anybody. But because I recognized that I was incapable of instilling anything in the life of anybody, you allowed me to instill things in the lives of others that count for eternity through the work of your spirit. I am not worthy. The least of his favor. That's the mentality that is necessary. So I live knowing I'm capable of sin, but I'm not culpable of sin. Wow. Prodigals live with a mentality of repentance, knowing that our need is Christ. What do I need? I need Christ. And he is all I need. And that's the mindset of a prodigal. That's the mindset of repentance. And none of us deserve what we're going to get. And when we get to heaven, the thing we're going to say, hallelujah, what a Savior. The second theme I was going to hit on today, I don't have time to hit on, is the theme of home. And let me just set you up for next week. This is going to get longer than I thought. When this kid comes to the realization, however old he is, when he goes out and he takes a journey, and his journey leads him from poverty to absolute ruin and total desperation, longing to eat what the pigs ate, he said one thing, I just want to go home. And he turned his heart toward home. So I want to talk to you next week about the mindset of a, uh, a prodigal is a mindset that looks toward home. And who was it in culture that said this? It's a quote. I know everyone of you know it. There's no place. You can go on vacation, vacation season. And uh, for me, if I go on a two-week vacation, this is what it's like. It takes me two days to get out of the mindset of all the stuff that goes on here. And then if my vacation is one week or two weeks or three weeks, it doesn't matter. I go into a period of time where I can just totally relax. 
Best thing I can do, I just turn off the cell phone, right? That's vacation. But then all of a sudden, when vacation's about to be over, about three days before it, I start thinking about stuff I got to do when I get home. And vacation ends right there when I start thinking about, and then I need a vacation from my vacation, from catching up from the things you had to do that waited for you the whole time your way. But the heart always turns toward home. Tim Keller said it this way in his book, we are all exiles on a journey home. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. So I want to talk to you next week about the theme of the mentality of a prodigal. It's always this. I'm a sinner. I need a savior. I'm on a journey, and I'm headed home. If you understand those two simple concepts, it will really help you as you live out your life. Now, let me just tell you this, and let me kind of give you this application, if I would. Develop the mindset of a repentant individual. You have to work on that. You have to maintain that. Ask me this. Am I a good husband? What would I tell you? Sure. Ask my wife that question. See what she says. The truth is, if I'm going to be a good husband, I've got to work on it every day. Sometimes a couple de- times during the day. Uh, all the time. And if we're going to be the believer that God wants us to be, this just needs to be a mentality that we work on constantly. Because I am somebody? No. He is somebody. And I am always in need of a Savior. And I challenge you. This is what a radical God demands of those who want salvation. You can't have a salvation until you admit you're a prodigal. And neither can you serve him if you don't maintain the mentality of, I am a prodigal in need of a Savior. But if you'll maintain that mentality, I am a prodigal, you can have a Savior. And if you'll maintain that mentality, he'll give you his spirit, and you can serve him effectively, and you can do things that count for eternity. We are prodigals on a journey headed home.